Hello, I'm going to show you two paragraphs that illustrate some commonly held concepts. And then after uh, briefly discussing the paragraphs, I'm going to show you an alternative approach based on first principles of physics. Okay, here's the first paragraph. This comes from a Piano Technician's Journal issue on angel shot voicing. And I'll let you read that. So I suggest you pause the video and read it. When you finish reading it, then we'll move on. Okay, pause it now if you would. Okay, here are some of the, the key assertions that came out of that paragraph. The idea that the string divides into multiple segments then that vibrate individually, that the higher partials come from the smaller segments, that the string divides into a short, stiff segment between the strike point and the graph, and that behaves as a stiff bar. The string divides into a longer, flexible segment between the strike point and the bridge. And these break into those smaller segments that are mentioned up here, and they provide the partials. Power comes from the stiff, short segment. Tone comes from the longer, flexible segment. And this is all proven by experiment. Here's the second paragraph. This comes from Pianos Inside Out, and it deals with inharmonicity. And again, I suggest you pause the video and read it. And then we'll move on. Okay, here are some of the key assertions. The string breaks up into partial generating segments. This is similar to the one of the assertions in the first paragraph. The segments are increasingly stiffer. The increased stiffness causes resistance to bending, and this bending shortens the effective length which causes the pitch rise, which leads to inharmonicity. Okay, I'm going to now present an alternative approach that does not use any of those assertions, and it's simply based on physics. This isn't original with me. Uh, Lord Raleigh was one of the first investigators, 1894. Philip Morse wrote a wonderful textbook from in 48 about it. Hardy Fletcher wrote a beautiful uh, journal article where he presented an equation that I'm going to use, at least one of them. And then uh, these gentlemen here did a lot of work writing journal articles in the 90s. And then Nicholas Giordano wrote two textbooks this one I use a lot here, the computational physics. But this one here, the physics of the piano, is actually a non-mathematical book. And it's quite insightful, and I recommend it. And it, I got a lot of ideas from it. OK, both of these quoted pro paragraphs dealt only with the hammer and its interaction with the string, and then the string's interaction with the bridge. They didn't mention the soundboard, and uh, I'm going to do the same thing with my model. And you can get some insight into why this works from Nicholas's book. Okay, a few comments about traverse. I think it should be obvious what that means. Pause the video if you want to read it. Okay, we're going to apply Newton's law of motion. F equals MA, or MA equals F, to a small but finite element of the piano wire, which is right here. Here's the a graph. Here's the bridge. This blue line is the axis of the wire at rest. And we're going to apply this F equals MA to this element. An element can uh, occur any place along this wire. Now, for this element, we're going to add up the forces. 
first force is the force of tension, which is shown here with the T, and it's a consequence of the fact that the string has been tuned. There's also a force against bending, which is a consequence of the fact that the string or the wire is elastic, and any time you bend it, or it gets bent because of vibrations, there's a resistance to that bending because of its elasticity. And for example, if you take number 15 piano wire and lay it on the table, say a short piece about maybe a foot, and then you put your fingers on the end here and try to bend it into this shape, and then release one of the ends, it'll spring back to its previously undeformed state because it does not like to be bent. And this leads to inharmonicity without using any of those assertions that we talked about earlier. There'll be a force of friction, which will cause decay, and there'll be a force on the hammer strike. And we'll have to develop a second equation for that. But anyway, we, for this equation right here, the element has mass and it accelerates in response to these forces. We'll shrink that element to infinitesimal size and out will pop a differential equation, which we'll use. And now a few comments that, uh, about inharmonicity, which was the topic of that second paragraph. It's a result of dispersion, which happens when a transversely vibrating wave passes through an elastic medium. The higher frequency components move faster than the lower frequency components. An example is light, which is a transversely vibrating wave. And when white passes, when light passes through a prism, which is elastic, it experiences dispersion, where the higher frequency components, like the violet waves, travel faster than the lower frequency components, the red waves. Another example of a transversely vibrating wave passing through an elastic piano wire. Now this is the second equation I was talking about that we have to develop to take care of that term there, the hammer force. And we're going to develop it, this equation between the hammer mass, its speed, compression of the felt, and it'll generate this force exchange term. So here's the piano wire, here's the hammer, here's the felt, and it strikes the string and it compresses the felt by about this much. Of course, this dynamic is going to change, the compression will change. But when the felt is compressed, it reacts by generating a force that it exchanges with the wire that's proportional to the amount of compression taken to a power. But that equation that we just talked about will give us the answer to what we put in that spot right there. Okay, we've developed two equations which are going to describe a first principles model of the piano string when it's hit by a hammer. Now let's go to the movies and see what results. Okay, get the MATLAB script going here. Okay, now here's some numbers that you can refer to to help understand what's going on as I run that simulation. We're going to look at a C2-like string, which has these parameters. The speaking length is going to be over a meter and a half. We're going to strike the string at one eighth of its speaking length, which is going to be right here, 0.194 meters away from the graph, and 1.35 meters away from the bridge. Using the dimensions and the density and the characteristics of the string, you can calculate that the average speed of a wave moving through the string will be 202 meters per second. And that'll allow you to calculate the time it takes to reach places. For example, the time it takes to reach the graph from the strike point is a little bit less than a millisecond. The 
time it takes to reach the bridge from the strike point is about 7 milliseconds. Okay, here is the graph that we're going to use to demonstrate how the model responds. I'm plotting the string amplitude along the string. Here's 1.5 meters over here. So here's 0 meters. Here's the graph. Here's the bridge. And we're going to strike the string here, that little green point, which is one-eighth of the speaking length. Down here, I'm going to plot the vertical component of the force exchanged between the bridge and the string. And it'll be a function of the slope over at this point. In other words, if the slope is negative, it's coming down like that, and it's going to be pulling up on the string. And there'll be a positive force shown here. I'm plotting this against time, by the way. Up here, it's against position. So two different plots. If the slope is negative over here, because it's pulling down, there'll be a negative, I'm sorry, it's positive pulling down, there'll be a negative force over here. Okay, let's start this. I'm going to show up here the time that we go through. Okay. We've got 1.4 milliseconds. So the string, the, the, the strike has caused two waves to be generated, one moving to the left, one moving to the right. The one that was moving to the left has already reached the graph and is starting to come back. The one moving to the right has not still got a ways to go because we're at 1.4 milliseconds. It's going to take about seven milliseconds for it to get over to the bridge. Now, this component over here, the left-moving component, or the originally left-moving component, is going to hit the graph and get reflected and start moving to the right, and it's also get, going to get its amplitude flipped, so it'll be negative. So when it goes back this direction towards the bridge, it will take away from the amplitude of the overall wave, and it'll make it look like there's a tail, and it'll make it look like there's just one pulse moving to the bridge. All right, let's continue. All right, now the, this apparent pulse is moving towards the bridge, and we're still developing a tail here, which is coming from the reflected component off of the graph. The slope over here at the bridge is zero, so there's nothing to plot down here in terms of the vertical force. All right, so see the tail over here is developed. We still have slope, zero slope. Now we're starting to pull up on the bridge because the wave has reached the bridge. Here's a positive force down here. And now we're starting to pull down on the bridge and there's a negative force being exchanged between the bridge and the string. Now the wave is starting to move back towards the graph. The slope at the bridge is now zero, so there's no force, no vertical force. And now it's being reflected, coming back towards the bridge. Reaching the bridge, pulling up. And you notice there's a little dip right here that wasn't over here. And that's because of the dispersion. The higher frequency components are getting ahead of the bulk of the wave. Okay, it's going to continue. And now we've reached the end of our simulation, graphically anyway. We simulated 30 milliseconds. We've got two peaks, two pulses here in the force exchange between this bridge and the string. This one peaks at about, about 8 milliseconds. This one peaks at about 23. 
difference is about 15 milliseconds, which is the fundamental period of the C2 string. This series of pulses of force are the what's going to be generating the sound. Okay, here is a longer picture of the force exchange between the bridge and the string. In other words, this got 80 milliseconds here. Here I was using about 30. You can see here's the first two pulses that we already showed. Here's that little ripple or little dump. Here's an, you see it's getting more pronounced as time goes on because the higher frequency components are getting ahead of the bulk of the wave. All right, then the other thing you want to show is the spectrum. Here's the spectrum of the force exchange between the bridge and the string. You can see I'm going to peak here at the fundamental, 65.4 hertz. The red shows where the harmonics occur. Here's the eighth partial. It's attenuated because we struck the string at one eighth of its speaking length, so we wiped out the, that, didn't wipe it out, but attenuated that particular component. And you can see as we get higher frequency here, the peak is starting to get sharp relative to the harmonic. And that's a plot of power versus frequency, and I'm looking up to 1,000 hertz. Let's take a wider view. Okay, here's the spectrum again, plotted for 2,000 hertz, power, frequency. And here's the eighth, 16th, 24th. Those are all attenuated because we strike at 1 eighth. And then over here, when on the higher frequencies, we start to get more and more sharp relative to the harmonics. And we're developing this characteristic of inharmonicity, which is a consequence of dispersion. Okay, let's just listen to the sound of this force on the bridge. This is not going to be the soundboard. This is just that the force that's going to be driving the soundboard, and it's not going to sound exactly like a note, but it'll sound close. Here we go. Okay, you saw the decay that I put in there because of the friction. And you also sound, heard a sound, heard a sound that is kind of like a C2 note. Okay, let's, uh, we're all done with the simulation. Let's go to this. Okay, and, and I'm going to repeat, or replant, reprint these assertions. I'm not going to read them to you because you've already seen them. Pause the video if you want. But anyway, uh, None of these characteristics showed up when I did the first principles simulation. Okay, thanks for watching and listening. And if you have any comments, send me an email.